looking at a shooting star. Got more than a couple of people going mad. I swear they're rooting hard. Till I might be big in a game like she went and got them breast implants. I said I'm moving too fast. Didn't even get a glance. I'm ready to eat up trap like I'm seated in a restaurant. If you had swag like mine, you know it's best to flaunt. Your friend, your neighborhood administrator, DJ Barbecue. We have a special guest today, and a Christopher Tuff, a Midwestern radio icon, a professional wrestling professor of knowledge. I want to welcome you to the Christopher Tubbs effect, or experience, which way ever you'd like to call it. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm good. Uh, yeah, when you say effect, is it effect or effect? Because uh, both of those can be taken negatively. And you know what? As long as it's not the butterfly effect, I'm okay. So DJ BBQ, what's up, my bro? What's not up? Not bad, not bad, man. It's all positivity around here. It was all good. Good intro for you. Uh, you know, we could say the the Christopher Tubbs experience. You know, it worked in it worked in uh, WWE. Why not work in uh, radio, uh, you are one of the, uh, the basically uh, one of the well-known radio hosts in Minnesota. Uh, you were down in uh, Houston, Texas, if I remember right. Um, yep. It's good to see you. Um, tell us a little bit, if the audience doesn't know you, because a lot of them may not, uh, tell, them, tell us about yourself. Well, uh, originally from the southwestern part of uh, Minnesota, originally uh, Marshall and, and uh, graduated Redwood Valley, Redwood Falls. Uh, went to college in North Dakota State, um, been in the Twin Cities a couple of times. I've done some national and local radio basically all over the country from anywhere from Detroit Lakes, Minnesota to Houston, Texas to Fargo, North Dakota to uh, you know Sioux Falls where you know you and I had a chance to uh, initially connect and now I'm back in the wonderful Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Yes, you're you're back into God's country, what I'd like to say the upper Midwest looks like. Um, so we we'd like to know, and I'd like to know, because I I've, I've I know a little bit of it, but not not too much. But a lot of these viewers don't know um, what really gave you the interest. What what really uh, got you connected to professional wrestling? Could you tell a little, uh, us a little bit about it? Well, it was just, I, I think it was probably mid to late 80s, uh, I would get home and from school, and I would watch actually a pro, uh, promotion, um, the USWA, and then I would watch WCCW, World Class Championship Wrestling, based out of Dallas, and, and uh, you know, I remember old school guys like uh, Eric Embry, and uh, P.Y. Chuhai, and you know, Chojo Yamamoto, and uh, you know, I started to to get into wrestling before I found out really about WWF, you know, now WWE. Um, but I started watching a lot of the AWA and realizing that that was based out of Minneapolis. Uh, you know, it was just it was very it was just something that caught my attention. And then once I got to to watching, you know, Saturday night's main event was really the big time event that, that I remember watching. And you know, guys like you know Hulk. Hogan and the Macho Man and the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase and you know Andre the Giant and, and all of these bigger than life characters, uh, I was hooked by the entertainment and the athleticism and you know I, I didn't know if it was something that was you know genuine or if there was some theatrics involved but I just know I enjoyed watching it and you know my my love of the professional wrestling industry. I'm not going to call it sports entertainment because sports entertainment is – it's not sports entertainment, let's be honest. It, my it's man, professional. my man, exactly. Yeah, but I, I've always been – I've been hooked on it since then. Um, so you did say the AWA, and now some individuals, unfortunately, uh, don't know too much about that and the, and the territories that you were expe speaking of. 
Um, what about Vern Gagne's territory, uh, the AWA? What are some of those characters and characteristics of that program that really caught your eye? Well, I caught it in uh, at the the tail end when when they were losing money. And, and again, I mean, when you're 11 or 12 years old, 13 years old, you, you don't understand the logistics and economics. You know, unlike a lot of people nowadays who feel like they know all of that. So, I mean, at that point, you know, we're just kids. We're you know we're watching because we enjoy it. Uh, I, I think it was just it, it was just very. It was very gritty. It wasn't a well produced, uh, a well produced program, and I, I enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed the, the the rougher, more authentic. It just it seemed more real to me. Um, and you know, and, and little did we know later on that the, you know that, that there were some things going on behind the scenes in terms of you know money and finances, which you know prevented them from uh, prevented them from from continuing on but you know I mean they had guys you know like the you know like the Kurt Henning I remember watching a, a Larry Zabisco or a Scott Hall you know guys like that who went other places and became bigger stars but it, it just it, it just from what I remember uh, DJ BBQ it, it was just a really it's just a different feel and it felt more real to me at the time as a kid so you were you just put out a good point there about the feeling real um, with now today's transition over to what we've had with no competition for, you know, 15, 20 plus years. Now with this new AEW coming in, and I know the events tonight um, as we speak, because it's Saturday afternoon here, um, NXT UK Cardiff just got over. It was a great program. I'm not going to say any spoilers because when we post this, it'll be uh, a little bit later. But do you see any characteristics or similarities that uh, connects with the old school days that you were talking about, like with the AWA? I don't, I don't think there there can be any of those. I, I know what Cody and the Young Bucks and Adam Page, and I understand what they're trying to do and bring it back to that, you know, to, to that era. But, you know, the, the bottom line is we know what wrestling is. They're, they're not hiding behind kayfabe. So to speak, you know what I mean. They're, right. they're 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 presenting it. They're letting us know that hey, we're not going to try and pull the wool over your eyes. We know that you know that this is an entertainment, and we're out here doing things. Uh, I don't think it'll ever get back to that point, but that doesn't mean that we can't enjoy it all the same. I mean, we watch, you know, Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones or you know, Seinfeld, or you can pick any of those shows on television and you can approach it the same way. Just because we know that these people are out there playing a role doesn't mean that we have to, you know, not look at it as being a legitimate form of, of entertainment. And I don't, I don't think we ever will go back to it, but I think if people can change their mindset, and be more accepting of how it's presented nowadays, I think people would be a lot happier instead of always complaining about, you know, what it is that they're seeing or not seeing. Right. So, like, let, let's uh, let's go in a little more in depth about what you were just talking about. Um, now with social media and with all these outlets that people can actually figure out what's really going on and they know more than what we used to back in the day when we were kids, with your experience, because you've had a lot of experience with professional wrestling as a fan and also in kind of the, the business side, if, if I could say that, if that's the correct way to say it, do you think that it's a, a negative that you have too much of this open outlet to see that? Or do you think it's, it, it's okay that, you know, you just got to learn to adapt and evolve on it. Yeah, I think it can be seen both as a, a positive and a negative. You know, the positive is, I think this might be the best time to be a wrestling fan because everybody wants more. You can never have too much wrestling at this point because you've got All Elite who is you know squarely on everybody's radar now. Uh, as we're recording this on Saturday afternoon, all out's happening in just a few hours in Chicago. Uh, you know, and everybody wants to know what's going on with Cody and the Bucks and Hangman and you know possibly CM Punk and everything there. 
Uh, you know, you've, you've got NXT moving to USA uh, in the fall. You've got SmackDown moving over to Fox. You've still got Raw, which is the flagship of, of WWF, WWE rather. Uh, you've got, you know, MLW, the indie scene is, is strong all around the country. So it's a good time because people want more. But then it's also, uh, I think we can look at it as a negative as well because you've got people out there who have access to information, but the key is they don't know what they're looking at. And this isn't a knock. We hear the word smart mark all the time. Right. And there are, pe there are people out there that, that feel as if they know more than what they really do. And while I, I applaud it, you know, sometimes people will throw things out there and you've got to be very careful with the news that you're getting and who you're getting it from because, you know, everybody, everybody should have a voice. I really believe everybody should have a voice, but not everybody is going to be on the same level in terms of the information that they have access to. And that's that's okay. Um, so I, I think it's I think it's both a positive and a negative. But overall, I mean, I'm I'm excited about the state of professional wrestling today. I really am. You did you did bring up a good point, and it, yes, it, it it is a positive with the uh, professional wrestling. I mean, we've never had this this much uh, content at all on all different sides. I mean, it's not just coming from one individual. But you brought up one good point though, that with all this knowledge, I mean, I caught one incident to where one of the, um, I guess you can say websites or, you know, social media accounts reported about a uh, individual doing something at WWE SmackDown live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And the one incident was right, but the other one that they also, um, reported on was kind of more of an exaggeration of someone's, um, own personal views on it, which it, it didn't really go down that way. And no one really got, uh, penalized or disciplined over it. The other one, that individual, that gentleman did, I don't really want to call him a gentleman because he, he really wasn't being gentleman like, I mean, he spit right in the wrestler's face. Um, I mean, come on, you gotta be realistic here. You're going to have your, your heels and you're going to have your, your faces. And if the heels is trying to taunt you that they're doing their job, you know, I mean, you can get a reaction and start yelling at them and, and, you know, hassle them to a, a point, but don't be spitting on them by any means. But the other one I noticed uh, it, I, I, I don't know how I investigated it, but it was on an individual's tweet and they just reported off of that. So you're absolutely right. You got to be careful on what you read um, or see in social media these days. But it, 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 you brought up another point. It does be a positive with the content, like I was just saying. Um, so we talked about that. Let's go back to kind of when we first around met. Uh, you were doing it even before we met. Let's talk about how your experience on being on the other side of the spectrum not just a fan but you were kind of on the behind the scenes part of professional wrestling more or less in the indie scene uh let the fans know and, and the listeners uh hear about the experience that you had in that part yeah it, growing up a, a fan you know i i always wanted to somehow you know figure that i could be somehow involved and i mean i'm not i'm not a big guy i've, I've never really been a big guy maybe five eleven you know, at, at best, maybe, you know, 195. Uh, so being a, a you know, a, a Hulk Hogan or, you know, a, a Ted DiBiase, you know, John Cena, something like that, that it was never going to, and I realize it's probably the first time John Cena and Ted DiBiase have been mentioned in the same sentence. Uh, but I was never going to be one of those big guys. So I, I, I met up with uh, a couple of friends and a guy by the name of uh, Jack Renetti. Uh, based out of Minneapolis, and he was big into the indie scene uh, here in the Twin Cities at the time. So I went and I watched him train. I went to a couple of his shows, and we developed a bond. And then when I went to uh, to college in Fargo, we continued to stay in touch, and we came up with the idea: well, why don't we start a? Uh, why don't we see if we can maybe start a, a little bit of a uh, an indie promotion in the Twin Cities? So. I'd come down maybe once a month with some friends, and uh, we started this thing called the TCWA, the Twin Cities Wrestling Alliance. And we, you know, did shows around the Twin Cities, and we would travel, you know, to, to several parts of Minnesota. And, you know, it, it was good because I helped him really kind of put that thing together. 
you know, from scratch, came up with the name, came up with the marketing, came up with the branding, um, would recruit, obviously, and, and I would be, uh, you know, one of the, the, the centerpieces for helping just to, uh, to get it together because it was something that, that we thought we could build from the ground up, and, and we, we had a good time with it while it lasted. Very cool. Uh, what are some of the other experiences you got also in that behind-the-scenes uh, position that you did later on after that? Well, you know, after you know, I was unable to, you know, to take part in the TCWA, I kind of I stepped away from being involved for a bit and you know focused on my career and uh, and other things, um, you know, with my you know my my wife and my family. Uh, but when I found out, and I was living in in uh, Sioux Falls at the time, that uh, Nick Dinsmore, who's a, a friend of both of ours, uh, he and his wife Stephanie, who's from Sioux Falls. Uh, they ended up moving to Sioux Falls. The funny thing was, I was talking to my friend Chris Carter, who works at the KTWB in Sioux Falls, and he's like, yeah, uh, Nick Dinsmore is moving to Sioux Falls. I'm like, no, not Nick Dinsmore, the wrestler. He's like, yeah. I'm like, Eugene. He's like, yeah. And I'm like, whoa, you know, that's kind of cool. So right. um, he, he put me in contact with, uh, with Eugene, and, you know, Nick and I met, uh, had some drinks, and you know, he talked about wanting to start a promotion in Sioux Falls. So, you know, he was like, well, you know, do you think this area would support it? I was like, well, you know, absolutely, because if you look at it, there's no independent wrestling around that area. I mean, there there was uh, Magna Pro out of Omaha, and uh, there were a few out of uh, North Dakota, but there was nothing in that area. And Sioux Falls being the growing progressive area that it was, I'm like, I, I think – I think you could pull this off. So he started talking about, you know, wanting to build a training center. So we ended up, uh, you know, going and looking around and finding a place uh, just south of Sioux Falls in a, a little city called T, which, I mean, you're familiar with because right. it's, you know, it's north of where you're at in Vermilion yep. and south of Sioux Falls. So uh, he rented a, a warehouse there and then, you know, coincidentally started training and – you know, came up with the, the, the name Midwest All Pro and we're looking at places around, you know, Sioux Falls that, that we could do some shows. And uh, I had seen the Roller Dolls, the um, roller derby team in Sioux Falls. I had seen them at the Sioux Falls Coliseum. And I thought to myself, with the upper level seating in the balcony, I figured this would be a great place. It would look good on television, uh, you know, it would look good on camera. I thought it would be a great place to, to maybe try it out. And you know, I, I know that they're running shows at the Icon right now, but I, I, I think getting into the market at the uh, at the Coliseum was good, and uh, it just, uh, you know, that was it, it. It was fun to work with Nick and Stephanie in the uh, you know beginning stages of, of Midwest All Pro. Right, right. So, like you, you did say that we we ended up meeting up, and I remember that show. Um, it was it was the first time that my son was able to see Midwest All Pro Wrestling. Um, I think if I remember right, that was the time I did the, the concession stand, but that was the time I think Shelton Benjamin was there and Damian Sandow was there. Um, so you said with the Coliseum that going a little more in depth, what did it take to get the show actually set up there? I mean, some of the, the fans, you know, they, they see the, the TV side or they see the, you know, from the seats or ringside, if you want to say, um, Tell, explain a little bit more what it all takes to get all that set up for the ones that don't understand that. Well, it, it, it was a matter of trying to find, you know, first of all, finding a date that would work in the fall that didn't that didn't conflict with a um, it didn't conflict with a major high school event or a professional event uh, because that's you know when you're starting out you want to make sure that you're not running into a scheduling problem where you could potentially take, uh, you know, take some of your fan base away if there's something that they might want to go to instead. Um, so it was just a matter of, you know, going and taking a look at the building and figuring out, okay, where could the ring go? Where could the lights go? You know, where could, you know, where, where could all of the, you know, where's the entrance going to be? What about the locker rooms? Uh, there were a lot of things to look at in terms of even seeing if logistically it was going to work. 
and then it came down to Nick uh, negotiating with the uh, I don't know if it was the the owner or the the property manager or uh, I I don't know who it was that he had talked to, uh, but he was able to work out uh, whatever the rent was, and then we would go back. We're like, well, okay, well, you know, we we've got this. We know how much it's going to cost. How do we market it? You know, how do we promote that? And and I was working at KWSN at the time, so I, I knew that I would be able to talk about it on the radio, and you know, hopefully drive some people to the Coliseum that way. Uh, and then it was a matter of getting a lot of the guys to put up posters, and you know, people don't realize that when you've got a promotion. Uh, an, ind an independent promotion, it's a lot of the grassroots, what they call boots on the ground. I mean, you, you don't have your, you know, you, your typical, you know, avenues for promoting. Nick and Stephanie were fortunate to be able to work with uh, a couple of television stations there and, and get some coverage uh, going in. Um, but it was, it, it was just, it was a lot of, of, of just taking a look at a, a lot of logistics and, you know, and then, you know, coming up with ticket packages as well. You know, you've got, you know, you, you've got your ticket tiers, you've got your prices. Well, then you've also got your meet and greet. And, you know, how much uh, of the meet and greet, you know, how much are you going to add on to that? Is that going to be something different? If it, it, You know, are you going to include it? So uh, there were a lot of things that went into it. And, you know, that's still being one of the first handful of shows. Uh, it was something that took a little while to uh, to figure out. But. Uh, I think right now, I, I think that, you know, Nick and Stephanie have a good, it looks like they've got a good routine, and, you know, they, you know they've you gotten themselves into a rhythm, which, you know, they're lucky to have because there are some promotions out there that that, that don't ever get themselves into the swing like it looks like Midwest All-Pro has. Right. Uh, yeah, they're doing really well, and, and you're right, though. It's the boots on the ground. It takes a lot of work, and um, as, as an individual that has stepped up in that situation, and brought it to um, a few cities that uh, one apparent one that I live in, and then up there in Sioux Falls, um, it, it's a lot of hours. I mean, you know, you have your job, and then you got to try to manage, you know, being a parent, and then trying to be able to have those volunteer hours to be able to go out there and 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 do all this work. Um, one other thing is, is when you're doing those type of events, is it easy to kind of get too ahead of yourself when you're doing that or is it is it something that you should be cautious when you're trying to do that event so like maybe if some of these viewers are looking into doing what you did up in minneapolis in minnesota um maybe you could speak on that of what it what they should uh should do should they get too excited to get their hopes up or should they just kind of stay level-headed well I, I think you gotta realize that when you're running an event if you think you're gonna have you know, if, if you're going to pull WWE house show numbers, that's not going to happen. I mean, you're just – unless you're paying out the nose for individual talent to come in, uh, that's, it's just – it's not going to happen. And that's okay. You know, I, I say look at a venue that is going to be realistic for the amount of people that you feel uh, that, you can, that, that you can market to. Uh, meaning, if you know, if you feel like you're in an area where you can maybe draw 100 to 200 people, find an area that is going to that's going to support that. I mean, you you don't want to go to a you know a 6,000 you know 6,000 uh, seat stadium if you only think you're going to be able to draw a few hundred. Uh, right. But there's, I mean, absolutely, if you feel like you've got it, you know, go for it. I, I'm never going to tell anybody. If you feel like you've got a good product and you feel like you've got something that people would want to consume, then absolutely go out there and, and go for it and do it. Um, I'd say just keep your expectations realistic. Um, you know, know what you can and cannot do. It and you know the the hard thing too, and you know this, that you can't. I I, I always believe you got to make money to spend money. But just make sure that you're not putting yourself in a hole where you're going to continue to lose money. Because one of the things that we see a lot of the times is sometimes promoters will put on shows, and then you hear these horror stories. Well, they can't pay the boys. They can't pay the talent. Uh, just, just 
you know, be be honorable with what you're doing. Be respectful of the people that you're working with. Um, you know, and, and and get people involved. I mean, there are a lot of people that want to be involved. A lot of people that want to help. Um, if somebody wants to help and you, and they've got a way that they can contribute, you know, lean on lean on other people. Lean on your friends. Lean on people that that are a part of your circle because you know if if somebody has something they can contribute then by all means use those skills right and those are definitely some words to live by definitely because it, it's it's with your experience you know and then with mine um just recently i mean you can get your hopes up and it, you can get you know pretty much you know stabbed right in the in the gut a little bit you know not the um, just to, to speak on that, because it, it, it can you can get your uh, ego into it, and then it's like okay, you're not getting those numbers, those crowds. So yeah, that that's really good words to live by. Um, to end the show, uh, why don't you give us a little update on uh, what you're doing now and uh, what you're planning on maybe doing in the future? Well, r right now we've just recently moved back uh, home from Houston, Texas to uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, my wife and my, uh, me, myself, uh, my wife and my daughter. Um, so I'm up here working for uh, WCCO Radio, uh, doing some producing and doing some on-air, so uh, also doing some podcasting as well. So, um, you know, life, you know, life is good, and, you know, I've been asked about getting back into the professional wrestling business, and, you know, I, I obviously can't, you know, because of my, you know, my neck, I, I can't take any bumps. Um, but you know, who's not to say I, I won't be around. I've got a lot of people that I know up here in the twin cities, uh, still know a couple people in South Dakota. Um, and I mean, you just, you, you never, man, one thing about this, my brother, you can never say never, never say never. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking to, once my schedule settles in and, and, uh, you know, we kind of get into a little bit of a rhythm or a routine here. I mean, who? Who knows where you might be seeing me pop up? But I'm, you know, just I'm happy to be home. I'm I'm happy to be, you know, uh, you know, stay a good job, good company, you know, making a, a decent paycheck. And you know, now it's all about living life and having fun. You know, you can't see this, but I'm pretty sure that you know right now how big of a smile that 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 put on my face to know that you can never say never. But the point of it, you said that you might be getting back in there, and you still know the boys in South Dakota because. I, 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 my, my brother, it'd be great to see you come back. It was awesome to see you move up back in this area, part of the Midwest. And, uh, I wish nothing but gold and happiness for your family in your new endeavor up there. Um, thank you for being on the show. I appreciate it. Um, please, uh, next time when you get a chance, let's do this all again. Um, man, it's just great to hear from you again. I appreciate it. Not a problem at all, and uh, who knows? I just might have to use a map to find out where you guys are going to be at. And you know what? We'll end it with that. All right, Mr. Tubbs, thank you. Uh, everybody, viewers, have a good night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shoot, 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 shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah.